Today I'd like to talk about some basic concepts when you first enter the lab. So everything that we're going to discuss in this video is very introductory. It's meant for a person who's never really been in a wet lab and it's really just directed at explaining the basic rules and the basic pipetting skills necessary to be in a wet lab. So let's start with discussing some key rules. These are rules that are mostly applicable in our lab, but I think they would be generally applicable to any lab that you were in. So the first thing is that any normal lab rules that you may have heard in classes or in biology labs in your school always apply. So that means things like dressing protectively, making sure there's no food in the lab, tying back very long hair, trying to wear closed-toed shoes, all of those types of things always apply no matter which lab you're in. It's also very important when you're starting out to make sure you don't use or touch things unless you're trained on them. Often labs will share equipment and they will have very expensive equipment in the lab and you don't wanna be the person who's going to be blamed for something breaking or not working. So if you don't know what it is or you don't know how to use it, don't touch it. When you are working in the lab and you have something that you are working on, make sure that you label very, very well and that you're very careful about what you're adding into which tube. The hard thing about wet lab and molecular biology is that everything often looks the same. It's a bunch of little tubes with liquids in them. We do a lot of different things and it's sometimes very easy to get mixed up between which tube has which thing. So it's really, really important that you label things carefully so you can keep track of what's going on and what you've been doing. At, when you're new in a lab, it's also good to ask lots of questions. Most people would rather that you ask them questions and learn about what's going on than have something go wrong. So if you're unsure of anything, even if you have just asked the question, go ahead and ask the question again. And then finally, it's always good to be a team player and be organized and reliable. A lot of labs depend on their publications being a group effort and everyone contributing and so just be a team player and be helpful in any way you can. So now that we've gone over some basic rules that I think would be helpful for anybody anywhere, let's talk about some simple things that are common across most labs that will be good to know. So the first thing is the different types of trash in the lab. So this is actually pretty important because different types of trash are going to be disposed of differently and you don't wanna put the wrong thing into the wrong bag because every single trash type has a certain disposal protocol. So these are four common trash types that are seen in a lot of labs. The first one is a burnout bin, and this is essentially a biohazard bin. So anything that is biohazardous can go in it. Some labs choose to use these for specific purposes. For example, our lab uses this mostly for putting in long pipettes from tissue culture. Some labs choose to use them for glass waste or for other types of waste, so make sure you know what kind of waste it is, but it is always going to be biohazardous waste, as you can see here. The second type of trash is a sharps container, and you've probably seen these even in your school labs. They're usually everywhere in any standard lab, and these are intended for glass and blades and anything else that could be potentially dangerous. Then you'll have your standard biohazard bins, which again will be scattered everywhere in most standard labs. And these are for all the waste in the lab. Any kind of waste can go into them that might be potentially biohazardous. And then finally, you have your regular trash, and this is for paper trash, anything that's definitively not biohazardous. Maybe you just open something fresh and it's just plastic or paper, that can go in the regular trash. The next thing to be aware of are the different types of tubes in the lab. And I put this on here because often older mentors will just assume you know what these are and will be like, go get me a falcon tube or go get me an Eppendorf and think that you will just know what they mean. But if you don't, this is probably important for you. And so there are two types of large tubes in the lab called falcon tubes. And these are sort of these tall tubes that are tightly capped. There's a 50 ml size and a 15 ml size. And these are commonly used for tissue culture, for spinning down cells or solutions, um, for bacterial pelleting sometimes. So there's a lot of uses and a lot of reasons. They're often used to measure things out in the lab or make certain solutions. So there's a lot of times when you'll turn to these tubes. 
And similarly, another really common tube that we use is an Eppendorf tube, which is the much tinier version. So this is going to be 0 0.6, 1.5, and 2.0 ml tube. So this is the 0 0.6, this is the 1.5, and this is probably the one you'll use most commonly for almost all applications. And then this is a 2.0, which is relatively rare to use as well. Um, so the one that you'll find most useful to know about is this one right here. Okay. The other thing to know about is the types of pipettes. And I'm sure this has already come up if you've been in a lab, but it's very, very important to understand the right ranges for every pipette and what volumes they pipette and how to set them. Because if you do that incorrectly, you're going to mess up your whole experiment and you might use more or less antibody than you need to. And some of those things are very expensive, so you definitely don't want to mess up pipetting them. So first, let's talk about the types of pipettes. There are single-channel pipettes, which is what this is, and then there's multi-channel, which allow you to pipette 8 to 12 wells at one time. Um, every pipette at the top has a little round icon, and that is going to show you what the range of the pipette is. So you can have what's called a P10, which usually has a white color. You can have a P20 and a P200, which are usually yellow orange colored. And then you can have a P1000, which is almost always blue. Um, and then sometimes on the pipettes, it will tell you the exact range. And sometimes it will just say P10, P20, P200, and so on. But a good rule of thumb is that you just divide by 10. So a P10 could go from 0 0.1 to 10, but in this case, it's only gonna go to 0 0.5 because it's very unsafe to pipette under 0 0.5. You're just very unlikely to get the right amount of fluid. A P20 is gonna go from two to 20 because you just divided by 10. The same for a P200, you can see that it goes from 20 to 200. And then importantly, a P1000 goes from 200 to 1000. And you can remember that just by remembering that you already have a P200, and so for anything that is under 200 microliters, you would want to use a P200 because it would be more accurate than using a P1000. So once you understand which pipette to choose, you then need to make sure you know how to set them. And so most pipettes will either have a red line that indicates a decimal or the number itself will be red. And so in some pipettes, this last number is actually red. And so this would be a red five and a red zero. Um, and in some, it's just the line. So let's talk about how to actually set them. So if you were looking at a P10, then that red number or that red line is going to indicate your decimal point. And so it's very easy inter to interpret as just gonna be the bottom two numbers will show you whatever your setting is with a decimal point in between. So this would be 2.5 and this would be 9.0. Um, for a P20, it's a similar situation where the bottom number or this red line is gonna show you your decimal point and so you can just read it as 2.0 or 15.3. A P200 is a special case because it actually uses all three numbers to create a setting. So you don't have a red number or a red line on a P200. So you're just going to read the number off exactly as it is. So this would be 31 and this would be 128. And then finally for a P1000, it's again kind of a special case because you do have a red number, but that red number is the top number. And in this case, it's not going to indicate a decimal point. It's just going to indicate a zero or one based on what the thousands place is. So if you see a red number at the top, that means that you should multiply whatever you're seeing by 10 to get the reading. So that means that this would be 225, even though it's showing you a 23.5, it's actually 225. And this would be a 100 that it's showing you, but since you multiply by 10, it would actually be a 1000. So whenever you see a red number at the top, you multiply whatever you see by 10. On a P200, you won't see any red numbers, so you just read it off as it is. And on the P10 and P20s, you will see red decimal numbers, and so you just read it as a decimal wherever the red number is or the red line is. And then an important point of conversion to keep in mind when you're doing these is that 1,000 microliters 
which is the highest setting of this pipette, is going to be equal to 1 ml. So everything you're pipetting with these pipettes is under 1 ml in volume. So we'll just review one more time and make sure you can look at these and understand. But since this is a P1000 and we have a red number at the top, we're going to multiply by 10. And so this is actually 150 microliters. This P200 has no red line and no red number, so we can just read it straight off. So this is going to be 155 microliters. And then finally, this P20 is set to 15.5. And we know that because we have this red line and this decimal here, so we put a decimal point right here and then read it off. So once you understand how to set the pipette, the next thing is actually using the pipette. And using a pipette is a little bit trickier than it sounds. The first thing to realize is that there are two stops on any pipette. So you have sort of the starting position, which is the very top, and then there's a first stop. And then if you go just a little bit further down, there's a second stop. And you will feel these very easily when you use a pipette. It's kind of hard to explain, but the second you actually use one, it makes a lot of sense. And then all pipettes will also have an ejector button. So if we look at this picture of a pipette, the ejector button is right here. It's what her thumb is resting on. And this is the part that she would push down. And this is sort of your top position. And then your first stop is probably right about here, and your second stop is going to be all the way down when you push the pipette all the way down. So to actually use a pipette, you're going to push down to the first stop. So you'll push down to the first stop, and then you'll go into the liquid, and then you'll pull up. And that will allow you to get the most accurate pipetting possible. When you want to dispense liquid, then you're just going to push all the way down. So you eject all the way down to the second stop, and that will dispense everything that is in the pipette. Another important rule to keep in mind is that when you're pipetting very, very small volumes, you want to make sure that whatever you're pipetting into, it actually goes in. So if I have this giant 15 ml tube and I have tons and tons of liquid in here, and I add just one microliter, and I add that one microliter way up here, all the way up here, that one microliter might never make it into my solution and it might never mix into my solution. So it's very important that when you're pipetting really small volumes into a large volume, that you put the pipette tip all the way into the liquid and add your one microliter in the liquid. And that way you can make sure it mixes very, very well. And when you do this, you also want to make sure that you push all the way down to the second stop. So all the way down, and then you completely remove your pipette before ever lifting your thumb up. Because if you lift your thumb up while you're still in the liquid, you will pull the liquid up with you, and you might end up just pulling out whatever you just put in. So make sure you fully remove your pipette before you pull up again. And then finally, it's very important to keep your pipette vertical when you're pipetting. You never want to go horizontal because the liquid might actually just drip back into the pipette, which will contaminate it for everyone else. Aside from the micro pipettes that we were just talking about, there are also long pipettes available in the lab. And so for these long pipettes, they look like this. You're going to use this type of pipetter and this top button will pull liquid up, and this bottom button will dispense liquid. You can recognize these by their color, and so the very common ones you see in lab is blue or purple for 5 ml, orange for 10 ml, and then red for 25 ml. Those are probably the most common sizes you'll see in any lab. These are very, very common for TC use and also for solution making, so you will see them all over the lab. Um, and it's just important to make sure that you are using the right one for the right thing. So like I said, blue is going to be 5, red is going to be 25, and orange is going to be 10. And you just want to keep track of those. And then this is what you're going to use to actually pull the liquid up and down. One important thing to keep in mind is that you should never ever get liquid higher than this line. So if your tip is attached right here, you should make sure that your liquid never goes any higher than this part right here, 
or on these pipettes sort of any higher than this up here because you don't want to get any liquid into this pipette machinery because again that will contaminate it for everybody else who's going to use it so always be careful of that especially in tissue culture where if you get it into this part and then you pipette it out onto your cells you might end up contaminating all of your cells and then finally, the last basic concept I want to talk about is dilutions and solutions and how you make them in lab. So the first thing to keep in mind here is that you need to know the conversion between milliliters and microliters. And as we've already said, one ml is the same thing as 1000 microliters. So now that you know that, you can easily go back and forth between the two units. All you're going to do is multiply by 1000. So let's say that someone told you that they had a 100x solution and they wanted you to make a 1x solution. Um, so that would mean that you wanted to do a dilution of 1 to 100. So you wanted to take whatever the 100x solution is and turn it into a 1x. So that means you're going to add just one portion of your 100x solution. So one portion of the 100x solution to 99 portions of water or whatever you're going to dilute it in. So an example of this might be that I want to make one liter of 1x PBS from a 100x PBS solution. So to do this, I would take one portion of my 100x, which in this case would be 10 ml, of my 100x PBS, and I would add in 990 ml of my water. And that would create a 1000 milliliter or one liter 1x PBS solution. Someone might also tell you that I need a 1 to 1000 dilution of an antibody. So I am running a Western blot, and my primary antibody needs to be diluted 1 to 1000. So this means that in whatever amount of liquid you're using, so let's say that we are making four mLs of our antibody solution for this experiment, and we wanna do a one to 1,000 dilution, four mLs is gonna be equal to 4,000 microliters. That's this conversion right here. And since we need one antibody unit for every 1,000 of solution, we need four microliters of our antibody in this 4,000 microliters or four ml of solution. So when they say I need a one to 1,000 dilution, how much antibody should I add? It's gonna be four microliters for four ml. All you're doing is taking this and converting it to microliters and then dividing by 1,000. This is important to be able to do correctly and quickly because it does come up for a lot of drugs and antibodies. They're almost always diluted in this fashion where it's one to a thousand, one to two thousand, one to four thousand. So you do want to be able to do that conversion fairly quickly. So if someone tells you, for example, one to four thousand, then what they're saying is I want one microliter for every four milliliters. So if I wanted to make four milliliters of a solution at a ratio of one to 4,000, I would be adding one microliter into that solution. So make sure you understand that math and go back through it a few times if you don't get it because it is an important skill to have in the lab. So thank you all so much for listening to that basic video. I hope it was a helpful introduction to some basic concepts in the lab. If you have any questions, you can feel free to contact us at Ahmed Lab. And w, this is our Twitter handle, or feel free to subscribe and see more of these types of videos and learn more basic skills.